So, um, for something completely different, um, I'm wanting to talk about our studio work in three cities, Delhi, Mumbai, and Freetown, Sierra Leone, uh, over the last 10, uh, 15 years, um, and look at three pro projects um, which have resulted from us going into slum settlements and acting as detectives, storytellers, and craftspeople um, to uh, generate both hypothetical and live projects, um, and see how far we can get up from the bottom up towards creating an effect on the city. I mean, we see the city as the primary institution uh, and the primary liberator of people who are coming to the city. Uh, by being engaged in the city, they, they improve their lives. So looking at the bottom, we would, we would do uh, measured surveys, uh, economic, ergonomic drawings. We would see how crowded uh, buildings were. Sometimes they're very crowded, as you can see on the left, and sometimes uh, people are trapped inside, for, uh, according to their gender, for example, um, like a bird in a cage. We would do, do extensive uh, measured surveys of vast slums. Um, this is an example uh, called uh, Kalyanpuri Block 1920. It's built between Blocks 19 and 20, so, and it, it was planned as a, as a green square, but it's home to Sikh, Sikh population, which was decimated in the riots of 1984, and so has reconfigured itself as a defensive community. This is another uh, illegal settlement um, built along a, a, uh, an open drain in South Delhi where we were, we were trying to look at what made the settlement uh, coherent and it seemed to be that there was a fashion for painting the front door of different colours and we, uh, this map is a map of the colours of the front doors on the fronts of houses. Having measured all the houses we found the colours on the front door but as you move out towards the city the, the um, settlement we were looking at is here um, you see that it's, it's, it's quite a recognisable shape, but it's amongst the many other recognisable shapes of, of uh, parts of the city which have been developing since the 13th and 14th centuries. We have a 14th century Chirag Dili, we have uh, an old experimental mosque of the 13th century, together with a dam, which helped, um, and we have uh, older organic settlements, the 16th century, we have more modern uh, uh, states that have been built up around them more recently, and this more organic settlement, and this used to be the, along the wall of the fourth city of, of Delhi. So it takes its place as an institution um, in, the, in the city. So students would measure up existing buildings, talk to the people there, and see that they had often a global reach. They would look at the scale at which they had impact. And these, these, um, th th these are, there are houses, they're courtyard houses called Havelis, but people make things. And these people would export their statues, because it was based on making statues out of marble, um, and they were exported around the world. Um, and we would then do projects which were, those particular people were used as clients for these hypothetical projects. Here's a, here's a project to control flooding in, in one of those drains and produce clean water and an urban farm with these people that were um, uh, talked to and, and uh, in the neighbourhood. Um, and th this is the scheme uh, on, on plan. Um, so uh, now we move to uh, Agra, and we uh, look particularly at this urban village, which is here. The Taj Mahal is here. Uh, this is Kuchpura, where we have been working for about uh, uh, 10 years. Um, and again, originally, the students would work in the same way. They had a cricket match on the beach and they, uh, with, with the local population, and that was advertised, lots of people were involved, and, th and this is where they lived, and that's the village, which we mapped, because there were no maps of this at the time. Um, and, and one of the students would create an institution uh, to, 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 to be the client for his hypothetical project, uh, based on the people that they'd met in the, in the cricket match. Um, uh, but then we came to a real project. So this is the institution uh, of the village, where four of my students uh, were negotiating how the life project, this first life project, would begin. And of course, it, brings, it, it begins very, very small. Um, and Mira uh, is, is, is a woman who lived in, in the village. None of the houses had any toilets at all. But they were getting increasing pressure, because as they went out to poo in the fields, um, this, and the city was encroaching, it became increasingly difficult. And women were presenting at the doctors with kidney uh, and kidney complaints. And so, but they didn't want to put such a dirty thing as a toilet in their house. Uh, because it was so filthy. But she finally was persuaded to do so by a local NGO, and she was in the newspaper as somebody who was agreeing um, 
uh, to have a toilet in, a, in her house. And so here we were, the stu four students went and worked with local craftspeople to build a toilet in her backyard. Um, and there it was inserted in her yard. Um, as, as soon as she got it, people saw how wonderful it was. Everybody in the street wanted one, which persuaded the local authority to pave the street, and it was renamed Clean Street. So here we have the local authority input um, to that Clean Street. Um, and it was necessary to build an institution about uh, uh, hygiene awareness related to having toilets inside the house, so students worked with the local primary school um, to spread the message, and the primary school kids became the policemen for their parents to make sure they did the appropriate things and that the, and that the uh, septic tank was emptied and so forth. Um, and, in fact, we then went on to build a, a, a decentralised wastewater treatment system, which is about a 100 metre long septic tank, which ended up with uh, clean water at the end, and dirty water went into at the other end, and Clean Street went into that. And it became, from the dirtiest place in the village, it became the cleanest, and people would have their weddings there. Next project is on the edge of Mumbai, peri-urban area on the edge of Mumbai. We were approached by an, a French NGO, to go and help them build their eye camp, because they did eye medicals every so often. When we went there, our students found that the uh, community we were supposed to be working with didn't want an eye camp. They'd done that the previous years. What they needed was a, a small school, because what had happened was the children of these quarry workers, they were stone quarry workers, um, couldn't get a state education because they didn't have an address. So a local NGO, uh, people like taxi drivers and other people who had an income, negotiated with the government and said, if we teach these children for a year and give them a certificate, will you let them into state education? So they did, and they set up these little schools in their houses. Um, and we, so we walked up and down there, and we found sites for where the schools ought to go. And we, um, uh, the children uh, got together marking out the school. This is the first school. Uh, and they got in, so the, the, the institution was starting right from the beginning. And here's the school being built um, here. And you can see that it fits in with the, the squatted camp, same sort of scale, but it's permanent. And, um, and this uh, school um, was the first permanent building in this township. When the roadstone was worked out, it would be normal to knock the camp down and have it somewhere else. But because we had started to build the school and we went back uh, over a period and would fit the inside out, um, and because the community uh, really valued it. They then painted it the same colour as the shrine, which is just adjacent to it. So when they painted the shrine, they painted the school. It became an accepted part of the village. And because this had been accepted by the community, people realised it was going to be a permanent settlement. They started to use bricks instead of tin and poles to build their houses. The local authority put in street lighting and sanitation and put a bus stop at the end of the street. So we grew a town. From building something which cost £3,500 to build, we grew a town. Um, moving then quickly on to the third project, which is in Freetown, uh, we were again asked to go and help, after that horrible civil war where people's arms and legs were chopped off, um, the, the, the boy soldiers were found themselves in a field at the end of the civil war, uh, and they couldn't write their name. Um, they had not, they'd lost 10 years of schooling. So they wanted their children, which they're starting to have, to have some education. The only woman in this peri-urban settlement who'd survived the Civil War, started to teach their children how to read and write. And this was the only education in the village when we arrived. Um, so, and, and a group of people had asked us to come and set up a school. They'd got a group of people who were all very eager, but there was no formal organisation. So we helped them to, to register as an NGO in Freetown. And we got, in this country, we had them registered as charity. And, and this was our first intention, was to build this school. And we realised that ventilation was very important in the wall and security and so forth. So we got into the making of concrete blocks that were ventilation blocks. And this, again, the students were, worked for a whole summer on this. Uh, this is the school, when, which built on the left is the entrance, and on, on the right we're looking out from the entrance. Um, and then we then later went on and started building um, uh, desks and chairs over a summer with the local uh, carpenters. Um, and, uh, and, and the school was going ahead uh, at full speed until the Ebola outbreak, when all schools in, in Sierra Leone were closed, and now this is the place where you register deaths, unfortunately, but it, we hope that uh, goes over and uh, something more hopeful soon. Um, so, but then you say, what can you do with this? How can you scale up from just a school in this peri-urban area? This is, the school is down here, 
and we thought uh, it, would, it was deserving of more uh, the institutional framework which set up there. How do you make that as contribute to the city, these peri-urban areas? And we, we identified, we thought, well, what we'll do is we'll concentrate on things that we, we are interested in and know about, which was architectural culture. And we found that 100 years apart, there was this area where the first freed slaves had built their wooden houses. There was this area 100 years later, in about 1902, where the uh, co colonials had tried to escape from the burgeoning city to sit on the top of the hill and look at the sea and then there was this area here, which was uh, uh, 2010. So we had about 1800, uh, 1900, and, and 2010, 100 years apart. And we started to uh, measure and survey them. So here's the, the timber house area. We, um, and we uh, did a long historical survey and physical survey of, of these remaining houses. Um, and uh, these are when some they're about to be demolished, and you can see how they've lent over. But they have a real taxonomy, they have a really interesting architectural character. And then we went up on the hill and we saw these other timber houses which were uh, colonial houses and people would look out over the valley thinking they were looking at the hills of Surrey and dream of going home. Um, and they had the first concrete in Sierra Leone and the railway sleepers as the uh, 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 columns. Um, um, and we measured those up. Um, and. And then if you look out of the, uh, uh, from those houses into the valley, that's what used to be a rolling jungle of, of, of green carpet is now down into the valley where our uh, peri-urban settlement is where we built the school. So we've come full circle. And we then therefore measured that area. So this is around the village where the school is. And it, there's a sort of high street along here. And we measured various uh, institutional buildings on, along here, like the mosque, the bakery, the clinic, um, and we put those in context as well. Here, for example, is a cinema. It's, got, it's, it's a bit dark on this screen, but there's two, there's two large televisions here, and they show um, uh, the, uh, the, the global network of uh, um, British football is, is shown there, and people pay to go and watch British football, um, and, and that's the main entertainment. So there's a sort of scaling element there. And then we had a big exhibition of the whole thing at the British Council. So we have not only the school, we have uh, some, uh, some really good examples of the architectural history of the, of, the, of, the, of the city, and nobody there had heard of them. Nobody had been taught them at school. All the school kids who came said, we never knew this happened in our town. Um, and at the same time, you had all the school kids that went to our school came to see the exhibition, and they were then linked in to the city as a whole. So institutional development started to happen. As a result of this exhibition, we were asked to contribute to the setting up of the first school of architecture in, um, in Sierra Leone. And my uh, fifth year students then did a couple of projects, hypothetical projects again, at the national scale. And here was a scheme for um, the uh, National Museum based on precedent that we'd measured up and uh, found elsewhere in, in Sierra Leone. Um, and then the second project was one for the School of Architecture. So here's the campus of the Sierra Leone. Here's the site looking out over the sea. And here is uh, uh, the idea that we would build the first studio out of timber on the campus. Um, we, so then you have ethical considerations, you have institutional uh, considerations related to that larger scale. And we moved up to the West African uh, region and we looked at the supplies of hardwood and when, when it was um, sustainably grown and when it wasn't and all the agreements that had been made in West Africa to try and make that so. So that became part of the agenda. Um, and so now we get, my last two slides, the idea of the image of the city. So this is Freetown um, when it was first founded in 1792, and that's what it looks like now. Um, and what we're trying to do here is to try and make the image of the city based on the institutions which are related to the fabric that we've been influencing, the physical fabric that we've been influencing, some of which are hypothetical, some of which are live. Um, uh, and so you can see the ABCD are... Uh, physical things that exist. Um, one, two, three are things that might happen or, or, or do happen. Um, and then these are surveys, a, the small ABC, and then there's these hundred years apart. So we're trying to get this idea of, of, of time. Uh, we've got these 12 streets which are all named after the directors of the Sierra Leone Company of, uh, in 1800, one of them which is William Wilberforce, because uh, this was the centre for the abolition of slavery in West Africa, uh, uh, and, and, and slowly one is hoping that you can build up the image of the city, which isn't just from a plan, but is from a section or a, or a view, 
which with the sea uh, as you come into it, the peninsula, which is quite unique within Sierra Leone, with its mountains, the, the city by the sea, but above it there's the views over the sea, like from the campus, like from our, uh, the hill station overlooking our uh, peri-urban settlement. Um, and so the, the, the point that I'm trying to make now as I finish up, which is that uh, when we look at fabric, we should also look equi equally to institutions at different scales. Um, and so that link must be built up by the enthusiasm, the energy of ordinary people living in peri-urban situations where the greatest change is taking place, so that they are engaged into the city from which they are benefiting and which they should democratically contribute to. And we really are, it seems to me, it's our duty to as much get involved in um, uh, generating institutions which match the fabric that we're proposing, the physical fabric. Thank you very much. <laughs>